Welcome to the Denton Black Film Festival Soul Talk with Muta Ali. The Denton Black Film Festival, as you know, is one of the nation's premier events, featuring five days of some of the best artistic showcases of Black cinema, music, spoken word, art, and more. I'm excited today for us to have this wonderful conversation with the award-winning film director from Westchester County, Muta Ali's latest documentary, Yusef Hawkins, Storm Over Brooklyn, airs on HBO this August 12th at 9 p.m. His past documentary films include the award-winning Life's Essentials with Ruby D, which featured notable guests, including Harry Belafonte, Alan Alder, and Spike Lee. I'm excited. To, to have this conversation today with Muta Ali. Hi, Neil. How are you? How you doing? I'm doing well. I'm doing well. I'm happy to be here with you. Looking forward to talking about the film and and uh, just sharing with you. Excellent. Excellent. Well, uh, you know, first off, uh, I'm I'm a, a do or die Bed Stuyer. So I I grew up in the in bed in the 60s and 70s, so right before this incident, but certainly well-known in, in bed and certainly uh, as, a, as a Black person in bed you never went to certain parts of Brooklyn because you knew you may not come back or you might get beat up. So this, this story is, is pretty profound in so many ways. Uh, tell us, uh, you know, for some of us know the story, but there may be listeners uh, who don't know the story at all. If you can set it up for us, we'll talk a little bit more about it and, and unpack this. Yeah, sure thing. So we're in New York, in Brooklyn, it's summer of 89. And on August 23rd, you have a group of children. You have Yusuf, uh, who is 16 years old, and his friend Luther, and his friend Claude. And... The three of them have another friend named Troy. And Troy is at that age where he can get a new car, he can drive. And everybody knows, you know, when you're that age, when you first get your driver's license, you're excited about getting a car and having freedom to, to a large extent. And one night, uh, Troy uh, finds a car in the classifieds, you know, in the newspaper, a uh, used car for sale in Bensonhurst. And they don't know anything about Bensonhurst, they're actually in East New York. Uh, but Troy is so excited to take a look that he convinces uh, Yusuf, Claude, and, and Luther to go out to Bensonhurst. So they leave that evening from East New York down to Bensonhurst. And when they arrive, they start looking for this car. And before they know it, they are intercepted by a mob of 30 Italian young men, several of whom uh, were armed with bats, some of whom had uh, firearms and they were cornered and Yusuf was backed up against a doorway um, and within moments uh, before even letting the attackers know who he was uh, Yusuf was shot four times he was shot in the shoulder and the hand and, and twice in the heart and he died on the way to the hospital um, long story short uh, his Murder took place shortly before an election uh, for mayor of New York, and his murder took place at a time where Reverend Al Sharpton was eager to cause change in New York, I'll say. And Yusuf's father made a connection and called to Al Sharpton after Yusuf was murdered, and they started to march through Bensonhurst. And from that point, uh, if you imagine Bensonhurst being a predominantly Italian community, I would say 90 plus percent Italian community, and Yusuf's family being African American, and the people in the protests uh, marching with them, primarily African American, there was a lot of chaos that ensued. And that <laughs> chaos ensued during a time where uh, David Dinkins, who was Manhattan Borough president, didn't need that racial tension and Mayor Ed Koch also uh, who wanted to be reelected for a fourth term as mayor didn't need uh, that tension and, and what you have there is part of the storm in, in Yusuf Hawkins storm over Brooklyn but that happened 31 years ago you know, August 23rd of this year will mark 31 years 
And so that's the the incident that took place. Uh, but Yusuf Hawking storm over Brooklyn is, is about um, the incident and some other some other factors. That's great. And we'll pause for a moment and let's show the trailer of the film. Sure. And then uh, we'll talk a little bit more about again, your approach to the film itself, uh, because I think that's a, that's really a critical part of why this is so significant right now. Yusuf, he had that little spark in him. He inspired his brothers. I saw it early on. My cousin's going places. People in this post-Obama era want to look at New York in the 80s and 90s in the lens of today, don't quite understand that the racial divisions were over the top. Bensonhurst made people say, well, New York is like that. As he stopped, a bunch of white guys came around the corner surrounded us. Next thing I know, I hear gunshots. Um, Bayless Avenue and 20th Avenue. Somebody just got shot. Bunch of white boys just shot a black guy. I got to ask you flat out, who killed you, Mr. It wasn't my friends, and it, and it wasn't me. My son has been tried and executed only because of the color of his skin. This didn't have never happened to him. They evaluate the evidence, they'll realize it wasn't a racial case. You'd have to be stupid to not determine that there was a racist element. Martin Luther King used to say, make the comfortable uncomfortable and make the uncomfortable comfortable. So I said, we should march in that neighborhood. They did not want us there, and they made that known. It's like unbelievable how people acted out. We're not just going to go away quiet. We will be back. It's not here for back. Yeah. One more win. It has taken us. Uh, my brother's death went down. People was yelling out his name. You back. 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 Just uh, sends chills up my spine every time I see that, <laughs> particularly the line that uh, Reverend Chopin talks about, how, how, how can the nation look at this and think that this is Brooklyn, New York? What the heck? <laughs> I, I want to start at this point of, 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 you know, 31 years ago, this, this, this happened. Uh, and, and I think your approach is, is, is a little different, that this is just not a typical documentary. Uh, I think you go a few layers deeper than what a lot of documentaries that, that and there's some there's a lot of footage of this out there. Anyone who researches this will find that footage. Talk a little bit about your approach to telling this story. Well, um, I'll, I'll just speak from the beginning. I think my my initial approach, I was approached by Victorious De Costa. Um, so he's a producer director. And at that time, this was before he did his first uh, feature documentary. He had, though, seen Life's Essentials with Ruby D, uh, the documentary I did with my producing partner, Javon Frank. And when he approached me and he said, Yusuf, I was confused at first because I got confused with Yusuf Salam. So uh, Yusuf Hawkins was murdered in August of 89, and Yusuf Salam was one of the five uh, kids uh, who were falsely accused of raping the jogger in Central Park in 89. This is, this is all the same year. So because I was... I was 10 years old when Yusuf was killed. Um, what I needed to do before I committed to doing the story, you know, with, with no budget and, and, you know, just it would be sweat and tears was to do my research because I didn't, it's so hard to do a film and to do a film with no budget um, is, is almost, it, it's, it's heartbreaking to do. <laughs> and so it, before I committed to doing such a thing, I had to, I had to have a need to tell the story. And I didn't feel a need to tell a story that where the point was just that, oh, this black kid was murdered because he was black. Ha, look at that. That, right. that, wasn't, that wasn't enough. 
And so upon doing the research, um, which included initially uh, reading For the Color of His Skin, the book that uh, journalist Don, John DeSantis did, and he covered the story uh, pretty well. I think that book was published in 91. So I read that book back and forth. I actually talked with John DeSantis. I met with him when he was um, in New York on a, on a book tour for something else. And what I decided was, you know, this story has contemporary relevance, not just because there's racism, deadly racism today, but because what led up to Yusuf being killed, um, there were some factors there that led up to him being killed that exist today. And the response to him being killed, um, that sort of response, the components, the ingredients that, that would cause a response like that are here today. And what I mean by that is, is um, if, I, if I can dig into it, is yeah, please. Separation in New York. Uh, it's a very segregated city. And it's hard to maybe hear that for people uh, because New York is uh, a quote unquote liberal city. And, and, but when you look down, top down at New York, uh, there's a great article in the New York Times uh, in 2015 called Mapping Segregation. You could see by race where different people live in the five boroughs. And there are lines, you know, you can see the lines where there's white people here, there's black people here, you know, and, and this is in 2015. And in 89, it was the same. I can't say it was much worse. It was it was the same. And in some ways today, the segregation is even stronger, especially when you think about our, our school systems. But I say all that to say that when you have people living separate siloed lives like that, all the information that we have about the other people and we can call them other because they're not around us unless they're on our commute to work or, or something like that is given to us by the media and television and that can work in two ways um it can work to someone's benefit as you see in the film Yusuf's friend christopher says there were no white people in east new york and if there were white people they were either the police or they were out there trying to buy buy drugs so to speak and those sort of uh judgments about white people went to protect them. You're not going to attack a white person if they are um, actually there to buy something from you. And you're not going to attack a white person if you think they're the police and have power over you. The same types of judgments about other people uh, existed in Bensonhurst. And this is not, if I grew up in Bensonhurst, it's not my fault. It just is what it is because of the larger forces at play. So when a black person comes to my town, I'm going to think of like, like that gentleman said uh, in one of the counter protests is stop selling crack. I'm going to think that all black people are crack dealers because that's what was selling newspapers, news, news stories like that. So journalists play a role in setting our understanding of other people when we're not around those other people and living in a situation where we're underneath some de facto segregation in terms of our environment allows us to rely heavily on those, those, um, the information that we get from the media. And those two factors alone played a role in how a young person, a young adult Italian man can judge a black person as soon as they see him and not even ask this person's name before they, they execute him. You understand? And so I thought that, you know, we're still living under those same circumstances to a large degree. We're still under that same banner of being liberal, but these traps are still set here. The components are still here for there to be another use of. And so that drew me to the story. And what also drew me to the story is when I like to tell, I like to tell stories that bother people. And I felt that denial was a big part of this story, racism denial. And I just like to stick it to people and, and through the archive and other conversations, you could just see the denial was just so deeply rooted in the community of Benson Harris. And so I wanted to put a spotlight that on that also. Adding on the good side, though, once I got to speak with uh, Miss Diane Hawkins and with Freddie, those were the two uh, uh, family members who I interviewed first. I understood something that you know more important than my kind of self-centered uh, desires, uh, which was that they hadn't had a chance to tell the story on their own. Diane was in such pain 30 years ago that she was not in a position where she wanted to be speaking about this to the press, and so three decades later. What I felt uh, my opportunity 
was was to serve as a way for her to get this off her chest. And that's that 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 same opportunity I felt I had uh, was to serve um, Yus Yusuf's brother Amir and Yusuf's cousins and Yusuf's friends. And, and you know, you've been bottling this up for years, and here's an opportunity to tell the story. So all those things combined was enough for me to 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 call my producing partner Javon Frank, and he's from Brooklyn. Uh, Tell, tell Victorious, you know, I'm on board. He's from Brooklyn. And Charles Darby, who's a Yusuf's childhood friend, who's, who's, whose uh, idea this originally was to do a documentary about Yusuf. The, the three of them are from Brooklyn. And we all joined together like a band of four mm -hmm. black people and said, you know, we're going to make sure this story about Yusuf gets told. And we just kept pushing. And eventually the doors started to open. What was the the family when you coached them? Were they eager to relive this story and tell that story? I don't think no, they weren't eager. They weren't eager, but I feel they understood the importance of telling the story. Um, I don't think anyone was eager uh, to go back into those moments. It's a it's a lot of pain, and what revealed itself to me was that this is a story about the, the the wakes of damage that happen when someone is killed um someone innocent is killed uh the family had to go through not only their loved one being murdered uh for such a stupid stupid reason you know they also had to go through mm -hmm. the sacrifice that I think is a, a gen generous one that black families give uh, when they allow their child's name to be martyrized, so to speak. And they were also put through the trauma of having to publicly grieve for their loss. When public grieving is a longer, sometimes more painful process than it is to do so privately. And they did that, you know, not only for justice, but they also knew that Yusuf's uh, murder was something that um, was indicative of the larger problem. And that allowing uh, activists, uh, Reverend Sharpton and others, to evoke Yusuf's name um, in that context of, of, of a broader problem, they knew that was important. And then after going through all of that, having to process things on their own there's, there's no there's no like pot of gold at the end of the rainbow for these families you know who you know we might know the name of, of yusuf hawkins but we don't know what the family went through and, and i was really pleased to see that okay this film is a window in for people to get a better understanding of what happens the trauma that a family goes through even when they're doing it for the right reasons it's, it's still a lot of pain involved so i appreciate that as a storyteller, how do you feel after, as you were pulling this all together? You know, certainly doing the interviews is one part, but then when you sit back and look at that footage and try to, to pull it together, what, talk about that experience of, of, uh, of again, capturing again, the pain that many of these family members are, and then trying to portray that in a way that shows respect to them, but also gets to the heart of how significant this is and how much their lives have changed over the last 31 years. It was, it was very challenging. You know, I like to record long interviews. So like an hour and a half would be the shortest, you know, sometimes, you know, two or three hours. And um, I don't even mean to, but it just, you know, a lot of it is, is warranted. And at the end of the day, um, I, I sometimes would rely on the transcripts, of course, uh, for key words, but looking through to find the emotion behind the delivery uh, was part of it. Um, it was very complicated, and I think I like that, but there are different layers. So when people hear the storm over Brooklyn, part of it includes, you know, the protests straight through Bensonhurst and the counter protests and the nasty things that they did. Um, when Sharpton and everybody went through the community. But then there's a mayoral race. There are activists who can, some can say are exploiting what happened to Yusuf. Some can play, can say that they are 
uh, affecting change in, in a righteous, uh, well-meaning way. But that's a layer there. There are attorneys and district attorneys who are campaigning. So not only is there a mayoral election, they're also deciding who the next DA is. And all of these people see that there is something that they can exploit. I can appear to be tough on crime, or I can appear to be sympathetic to these, these white racists. I can use this situation to my advantage. And all of those components are part of the story, including Yusuf and who he is, Yusuf and what he was about to do in his life, and including these attackers and what was happening that night, the whole dynamics between uh, Gina Feliciano and saying, oh, my black boyfriend's going to come and, and beat you guys up. You're in a, a part of Bensonhurst that is known to have some level of organized crime activity there. You have these young toughs, so to speak, who are trying to make a name for themselves. All of those things are factors in the story. So I had to explode that all out. And if I could flip the camera over, I'd show you. I have four boards over here. And I exploded it all out. And from then, I had to figure out what the story was. And I wish I had the answer to how I did it, but it's really a lot of trial and error, mm -hmm. it's really a lot of starting and stopping. It's really a lot of finding great footage, and it's really a lot of collaboration. Uh, I had a great editor, Ben Piner. Oh, Ben, oh, sorry. Uh, ben Piner was the archivist, so that's what I was thinking of. But I had uh, Jeremy <laughs> Seifer, Jeremy Seifer, the editor. I, I, I don't I don't have the direct answer how I came up with with the with the with the cut as it is, but I tried to fit it all in mm -hmm. at first. I had a thirty something page outline of the whole thing, and I wanted to tell all of the story. I wanted to tell, even back. I know you said from the '60s in New York, you had you had people like um, Robert Moses who was carving up New York into the different uh, areas that made it segregated in the first place. But once I decided, and I think it was while watching Miss Hawkins in her footage, that she was the star of this, I, I could tell, she's the one who I felt. I felt when she was, I felt her. And I'm like, she's at the center of this story. And I really admired Moses Stewart, the father, at the center of this story. And, and, and like so many of us do when we recall the story of Yusuf Hawkins, we forget that we don't know Yusuf. So I'm like, Yusuf has to remain at the center of the story. And, I, and, and working with Lightbox uh, Entertainment for this piece forced me to, to decide between two things. And that's for me to cater to the analytical side of, of what excites me about telling stories versus the character-driven side. And they really lean toward character-driven stories. And that was something that I learned during this process. And what I did was I turned the story inside out. And this was some guidance that I'll tell you I got from Dan and TJ, two of the executive producers on the film. Dan and TJ, they did uh, Undefeated. That's one of my favorite documentaries. And they did uh, LA 92, and they have the Tina Turner documentary coming out. They, uh, they said, they, they asked me to trust that I could tell a character-driven story and that all of the analysis would come through. And they left me with that, and I was like, I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> and I, and I, I gave it a shot, though, and I decided, you know what? This Black family needs to be the center of the story. So that gives me my arc, beginning, middle, and end. And I can talk about Yusuf, and I can go through whatever happened to the whole family, and I can hang the rest of, of the story, the political side, the, the, um, the activist side, the marches, all of that around what happened to the family. And that was half of the battle. And the other half of the battle was having already exploded out what I understood the storm to contain. That let me know what comments to keep and not keep in these interviews. So all of the research and analysis that I loved allowed me to understand that I need to keep when the EMT, uh, Gerald Dickens, when he describes what he found when he came up on the corner and found Yusuf on the ground, he said he didn't look like a thug. And I, I really like Gerald, but that comment about not looking like a thug connects with one of the themes, which is prejudice, you know? And, and so I knew to keep that comment. 
and I knew I could get rid of these other things. So I understood the larger analysis as I, uh, as I saw it, and then I yielded to the process of making it character driven. And then when those two things intersected, it allowed me to decide what stayed and didn't stay. When it comes to creating a film like this, though, I think the key is to keep going. We started, I joined in 2015, 2016, I got on board this film in May and we didn't get a budget until 2018. And in between time, it was just love and a desire to do something for my community that kept me going because nothing else, nothing else I think would be strong enough to compel me to go on a journey like I did. You know, I quit my job for it. I took a big financial <laughs> hit for it. I took a big risk and I'm glad that I did. But I think finding out what I loved about going for it, for this particular story was at the heart of me creating it. Because if I didn't latch onto that from the beginning, I might not have, I might not have gotten as far as I did. And in terms of the filmmaking process, once I got on board, you know, it's just basics, like making the synopsis, we had to make a production package. And eventually in the summer of 2017, we came across the American Black Film Festival's initiative that they did with Lightbox Entertainment. It's a documentary initiative. And I swear it was the day of the deadline that I said, you know what? Let me just apply. And I applied. And the only way that I was able to just on a whim do that was because we had faith from the beginning that we were going to get this done. And with that faith, we begged, borrowed and stole. We didn't steal, but we did all that we could to get the camera and, and get support. And on our own, we went and interviewed C. Vernon Mason. On our own, we went and interviewed Reverend Sharpton. We went and interviewed uh, Ms. Hawkins. We interviewed um, uh, Freddie Hawkins. And with that, I edited a sizzle and completed a production package just on faith. So that by the time someone sent me that email and said, ABFF and Lightbox have this initiative for documentary filmmakers, you should apply. I could just do it. I could just apply. So my, 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 what I'm trying to convey is that every step of the way, pushing as hard as we could is the only way that this thing happened. And hey, you know how you doing? <laughs> and um, a few months later, after applying to that um, competition, I got I got a notice from Melanie Cherie at ABFF, and we uh, and she said, you know, you won, you, you didn't win. She said I, it was a semifinalist semi-finalist and we had to do an interview over Skype. And so I'm on, on Skype with Jonathan Chin from Lightbox. And, you know, if you, if you look up Lightbox, they've done some wonderful film, you know, Oscar winning, Emmy winning films. And I was able to convey with everything exploded on those four boards right over there and they could see it. I made sure they could see it when I was doing the interview in the back so they could see how much work had been done. <laughs> uh, I explained to them the story and I said, act one, this, 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 and this. And, and they couldn't say no. And I didn't realize it until the end, but um, we beat out 300 something uh, candidates uh, for that, that competition. And with that, there was a $30,000 budget uh, provided to us and with that budget, we enhanced the sizzle. And with that enhanced sizzle, started shopping the project around and we ended up at HBO. And Nancy and Lisa and, and Jackie Glover um, at HBO saw the value in the story and they saw how dedicated we were. And I thank, I thank Jeff Friday so much. Uh, I walked up in the HBO office and it wasn't my first time. They had said no to me before about other things. But I, they couldn't say no to this. And Jeff Friday was by my side advocating. And Jonathan and all of Lightbox and Danny TJ were on, on the phone, you know, advocating for the project. And with that sort of support, you know, we, 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 um, we took off flying and HBO, they said yes. So I'm blessed. I'm blessed and thankful. Well, and uh, we worked hard on it. 
That's a, that's a great story. And I think that will resonate with so many of our creatives who go through the same process, right? Great ideas, trying to find a budget, passionate stories out there to tell. Um, what's, what do you want people to leave uh, uh, when, after they watch this film? What do you want them to feel? What do you want them to learn? Are there lessons that you hope that they pick up from this? You know, clearly everyone's gonna think about this film and they're gonna see what happened with George Floyd and Eric Garner and all these other folks and the protests we've seen uh, so powerfully in the last several months and the contrast of what, yeah, the, the juxtaposition, right, of what we saw 31 years ago to even what we are seeing now today. What's, what's your message or what do you want, what do you want to, uh, uh, to people to think about as they watch this film and, and talk about? So a couple of things, but what's coming to mind as you ask that question is, um, I want them to purge themselves, purge their minds of this idea that racism, it did exist, but it was a long time ago. I hate hearing that crap. It, it, it's just as present as, as it always has been. I mean, no offense. I mean, it's been, the, this is outside of chattel slavery and things like that. But the hatred, the hatred is there. And I want people to watch 89. And I'm hoping their minds, they remember living in 89 and remember feeling like there wasn't any racism, right? And so that when they think now <laughs> that, oh, there's no systemic racism and all these comments like that, that they can maybe imagine for one second that maybe I'm just as blind to it as I was in 89. And maybe these people who are telling me that racism is a problem today in uh, 2020 should be should be heard. And um, another thing that I want people to think about is what happens to the families. Um, because I, I don't, you know, it's, it's easy to, like, where, where's, where's, how, how are these families doing? How, how is the family uh, of Mike Brown doing? How's the family of Eric Garner doing? It, it gets lost on us because there's so much, so much, there's so much heartache and pain and so many things to fight for and worry about. But these families are who literally loved and raised the people who we, um, whose names we evoke. And, and um, I just hope that people think, think, think about it, think a little bit more about the pain that these families are going through and maybe extend some sympathy, empathy or, or something. You know, just understand that it, it is larger than the name. Uh, and that's not a, a criticism. It's just something to to maybe consider along with, you know, sticking to the mission of, of justice seeking. You think the, uh, you think there have been lessons learned in these last 31 years from, from, from people either involved in it as you've talked to them? Uh, did you see any revelations in, what happened then to what has happened now? I, what's coming to mind is Keith Mondello. I, I do know that he uh, attempted to ask the family for forgiveness sometime after he was released from prison. And he refused, we weren't able to secure an interview with him. And I think to ask for forgiveness is a sign of, of of growth. So, I mean, I hold on to that and I, and I hope so. I, I hope, you know, when you see the people who are saying hateful things in this, this footage, I hope that they've grown, but I can be naive, you know, and, and I mean, maybe some people are proud of how they responded when Reverend Sharpton came to their community. I don't know. I, I can be cynical and, and, mm -hmm. um, I feel like, you know, as, as a community, sometimes we might be in a culture where it's hard to be honest with ourselves about who we are. And it might be because we're so quick to judge. I mean, honestly, I was quick to judge Reverend Sharpton. You know, um, there's things that as a kid, I was told by other people that made me like, maybe doubt his sincerity and all this stuff like that. But there are things I've done in my life that might be, make people doubt my sincerity but i think the throwing the baby out with the bathwater and the, what the cancel culture that we have yes. there 
are it's problematic to a certain degree and i'm not coming to anybody's defense but what it does is it makes people who might have some growth to do some people who might have some hatred they need to look at be so afraid of looking at it uh that they won't change and they're afraid of looking at it because they think that if i admit to having this particular thing i need to work on then i'm dismissible as as a as a i'm not worthy of being loved by my community i'm not worthy of being looked upon as a good person and i think the sooner we can as a culture stop judging people so harshly and i hate saying that because people do some foul things but as soon as we can understand <laughs> that no one is perfect and it's, we're able to maybe appreciate people's value while also appreciating the fact that this is wrong and we need to look at it because the solution that i've seen now the knee-jerk reaction is to say no nah, no nah, there's no problem here we're not racist you know but then you have people get murdered you have people get murdered and if you keep sweeping things under the rug and looking the other way and acting like it's not happening then more people are going to get murdered and, and it's, I, I can't stand for that i hate that yeah, yeah we we're you know I've, I've had any number of conversations with people trying to project you know what's what's the conversation what's the world look like a year from now <laughs> no less next week or a month from now it, it, is, is this film out? Do you have thoughts about, you know, can can this film foster any of a different kind of conversation? Uh, has it fueled you to think about other projects that you want to do along these lines in some way to help people understand better about the world in which we live in, where racism is alive and well, and we have to tell this story? Uh, a little bit, you know, I've been, I've been reading a lot of Ibram Kendi, books and, and 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 what one of the things i i'm taking away from it and i and i don't really know if this is his, his intention i he's, i think he's a brilliant man so i don't really know everything about his intentions but is i don't want to waste my time trying to educate someone out of their hatred you know because it might not be worth it you know it might not be as productive uh, of uh, an endeavor as it is for me to maybe help articulate for a community um what might be going on in their spirit, uh, help put on a pedestal what they've experienced and help honor their experience. So I've, I've sort of made that distinction that I'd like to do projects that help capture an experience that otherwise would be hidden. And otherwise the people who are victimized by that wouldn't get to, to shed light on. I think I can serve in that way. Because there are a lot of people, you know, if you think about abuse, if you think about anybody who has been traumatized, if they aren't ready to talk about it or, or if they're not able to articulate it fully, it makes it harder, I think. And if, if I can serve as a way, and that's just kind of lofty to even talk like this, but if, if telling somebody's story can be helpful, helpful to them, then I'm going to do it. But I, I don't think I can rely on the hope that showing uh, racist that look your race is here look your race is here is gonna <laughs> gonna make them change because they got so many outs they have so many people including black people who are telling them oh racism is not really a problem and all that so i'm not trying to fight that fight but i am trying to fight for i've been told i'm good at explaining things so if i can help somebody explain something or help somebody articulate what happened to them then shoot i'm, I'm, I'm gonna focus on that with with this story, you know, there's you know, there's Yusef, as you said, who still is at the center of the story. He's the one who lost his life. Is what what's his legacy? Does this is there something more that we learn from his death in this story that kind of stands bigger than in this whole narrative we've been talking about? Well, you know, he's he's one of the few that that is faultless, you know, and I think his purity stands out and not that, uh, and, and that's not a judgment of other people. It's just those normal tactics of picking someone down or maybe they smoked weed or some, some, some mess. There's absolutely nothing that Yusuf was doing wrong. And I think that that um, is a testament to his character, but it also serves the conversation in a way um, because 
despite doing anything wrong, he still had his life taken from him. And I like the, the role he played in his family. And I hope that comes through, even though it, it's, you know, it's not a lot, we don't spend too much time describing Yusuf, but I felt that the people who were describing him, you would, you would believe everything they said. And the role he played in his family as sort of, um, and then the voice of inspiration, a kind voice, a voice of, of reassurance. Um, I, I hope we honored him by by showing that that's what he stood for. And I've talked with people who took a lot from that photo of him when he's uh, he's outside in front of this gate, and he's wearing uh, he's got his like high top, uh, and he's got the African medallion, and and um, he just looks like a nice nice kid who is is really proud of his. His, his culture and looking forward to life. And I don't know, it puts a smile on my face. So I'm glad that this story allows people to get that glimpse of who he was. I wish, I, we tried so hard to find video of Yusuf and I couldn't find any. Mm. I wish for so long that I could even hear his voice. I don't know what he even sounds like, you know, but I, I think through the through the family's comments about him, uh, we, we kind of, shed light on what his spirit might have been like you know that's that's fascinating in in that sense of trying to hear his voice because that's yeah yeah it, it's uh you certainly have done a wonderful job of trying to get to those people who can recreate that person that you've never met right which is so hard in stories like this um as you look at other projects, and you kind of alluded that your you know, this certainly has set off a number of different ideas in your mind. Are any other interesting things coming out after this that we should be aware of that you're working on? There's a lot, you know. You know, it's, it's, it's I'm at a phase right now where I I want to make sure that I have a, I don't know how to say it, but you know, when when you get an opportunity like this want to maximize it and i know i've already said publicly that i am working on a project surrounding the murder of carrie ball he was a young man who was murdered by the st louis uh, police department and and in a brutal excessive way and uh, the story though is not just a story about someone who was murdered it's about excessive force and it's about St. Louis, which is a city everybody knows, but they don't necessarily know. And in St. Louis, there's a lot of abuse that happens uh, against the, the black community that goes under the radar. And I hope through telling that story, we're able to expose some of that, and not just for the sake of saying, aha, but a lot of pain is inflicted upon, upon the black community because people get to hide. And I don't like when people who hurt other people get to hide. So I do look forward to telling more stories. And there are a few that I can't tell you about because you know we're, we're pitching and things like that. Um, but I do look forward to being able to dedicate myself to the full ex extent possible towards telling more stories that are significant. I happen to love telling stories about the black community. <laughs> so I think I'm gonna stay in that, in that lane um, because it's, um, I can't tell you. I mean, it was about three weeks ago and we finally let the Hawkins family see the documentary. And I'm like, why did we wait so long? What if, they, what if they don't like it and it's about to come out? But when I got the message from them that they they loved it and they gave it A++ and Amir was telling me how much he appreciated it, I, I was just filled with emotion, you know, because that that's all that mattered. That, that's all that mattered. And I think storytellers, there's so many stories to be told. And if we do it out of love, um, th there's something great that can happen, I think. There's something great and fulfilling that can happen. And I encourage a lot of people, because people call me sometimes for advice. The only really advice I have is to just keep pushing. And and I, I, I wouldn't be able to keep pushing without having supportive people around me, uh, therapists, you know, all sorts of things that help keep me sane. I will tell you this process was, there's a school of thought that says that you should, you know, if you look at those books, like the 48 laws of power, that you should be, just act like it's nothing. You know, it's not, yeah, yeah I did it, but 
but that's not the truth. This process was so challenging and difficult. Uh, nightmares, nightmares after nightmares I had. And I, I just, it was very difficult uh, to do this. But I think ultimately it was, it was absolutely worthwhile. And I hope, I hope people enjoy it. Mutali, thank you so much for spending time with us. Uh, I've learned a lot. Uh, I think this, uh, I think those as young filmmakers, as experienced filmmakers, can share your story because they've all walking down that road. Or uh, and you answered a question that I was going to ask advice to those who are wanting to tell these stories. That we know if we don't tell them, then either they don't get told. Someone else tells them in a way that just does not capture uh, some of the culture, the nuance, the pain, as you just said, that only we can feel because we, we, we live it in some cases in so many ways. Well, we, you know, the Dem Black Film Festival wishes you all the best of luck with the, the, the uh, show. We look forward to continuing to learn more about your works in the future. Uh, and, and please you know, keep in touch with us and all the best uh, with every one of your projects. Thank you, Neil. Thanks, talk, thanks for talking to me. This is great. Oh, you're very welcome. Enjoyed it. This has been DBFF Presents Soul Talk with Muta Ali. I'm Neil Foote, and thanks for joining us today for this wonderful conversation with one of the bright young filmmakers of our time.